Now I'm going to bring up uh, Dustin Van Ness, a, a board member of the Minnesota Farmers Market Association and a director, board director of the Linden Hills Farmers Market, and Cecilia Coulter again, who we're becoming quite familiar with. Another board director and manager of the Shiba City Farmers Market. We're going to talk about the business of operating a farmers market. It's a short 45-minute session, which could very easily be a three-day seminar. So uh, just a few uh, quick points here, and uh, I think it's mainly designed to get you thinking along the line of becoming professional in your operations. Dustin? Well, I don't know if I have anything professional to say, but... Um, so some of you might recognize me from sulking around your farmer's markets last summer. I'm the guy that was doing all the surveys for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, some of the numbers that you see on the screen right now are related to that survey information. Paul Huguenin was here in the spring to present some of that information to you and allowed me to take some of my information with and look further into that. Um, so last year when we did the survey, 46% 40 of market buyers indicated that the ability to pay with a credit card was important in their choice between vendors at a farmer's market that were selling identical products. Uh, I think that many of you here are vendors. Can you get closer? Many of you here today are, is that better? Yeah. Are vendors, and so a statistic like that could definitely uh, impact your sales at a farmer's market. Um, some other things to consider are that people don't bring a list to, the shop, to shop at a farmer's market. When they're there, they don't know what they're coming for generally. You know, you'll see a list every now and then, but it's the rare exception. What they're looking for is an impulse buy. They're looking for that, that great looking carrot. They're looking for that great looking tomato that they you know, hadn't seen before. It's all impulse buying. But they bring a static amount of cash. If you only take cash, then they only have a limited amount of funds to spend on your, your products. However, if you're accepting credit cards also, well, the sky's the limit and they're gonna spend more. I looked into the numbers that we gathered out of uh, over a thousand responses from over a hundred farmers markets in Minnesota last year and found that people that use credit cards at farmers markets were spending 40% more than those using cash. So that's a significant amount more that you could be earning just by getting credit card readers. But which credit card reader is the best, right? There's you know 20 right here and this is just what I could come up with in a, in a short time. There's many, many more and I see them advertised on Facebook all the time. But I'll take a look, a quick rundown of the top 10. And all this information is probably a little bit muddled. You can't see it from where you are. But this will be available on the MFMA website also. For Jesse will put it up there. So you can go through this list and look through. The 10 that we reviewed are the ones that I was able to get my hands on and have myself or Mark Vendors this summer that I'm associated with uh, using to test them out. And what we found is that most of them are about the same. <laughs> they pretty much all offer the similar features, with a few exceptions. Like Square doesn't allow you to void transactions for some reason. It has lots of bells and whistles, but you can't void a transaction. Um, you know, Merchantware doesn't allow you to capture signatures. It's, it's, so there's little quirks to each one, and they, and they change from time to time. Um, again, the compatible devices, they're pretty much all the same. With the exception of BlackBerry devices, they'll all be usable on either your tablet, iPhone, Android operating systems, smartphones basically. Smartphones can be had used on the market for fairly cheap. I saw plenty of smartphones on uh, Craigslist the other day for iPhones for less than 50 bucks for an older iPhone. So there's not really an excuse not to get this product when it can increase your sales so much at your farmer's market. Um, the credit cards that they accept, again, they're pretty much all the same, with the exception of uh, Pay Anywhere that doesn't ex uh, accept the Discover chart card. The prices, however, are different on all of them. When you get a look at the... When you get a look at this online, you can check out the, the top row just beneath the names indicate the, the discount rate or the, the swipe rate percentage that they charge you for purchase. Um, they're ranked in order of the cost of the swipe. Um, some of the things that I looked, we looked at were set up and application fees. There's no reason to be playing a setup or application fee if you see a car reader that requires you, that should be a signal, ding, 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 that that's not a car reader that you want. There's no reason to have that. Monthly fees, monthly fees go back and forth. 
depending on what your sales volume is, a monthly fee might be a better option. And we'll look into three that I used all summer, and I'll show you what, what uh, the kind of the cost-benefit ratios of those are as we uh, go on the next few slides. Um, the transaction fees are something that are a little bit small on this slide, sorry. But they, uh, they range between 19 cents to 27 cents, 30 cents. Um, the, the Intuit Go payment system has as little as zero dollars per transaction if you are on the monthly plan. Right here. <laughs> Uh, then free card reader. Again, that's one of those things. If you have to pay for a card reader, you shouldn't be buying it. These are free. Sometimes there will, you can buy them at like Office Max or, or the office stores and you will pay there, but they should include a, a, a rebate that you can send in. And that's more or less just to get, make sure that you're you know, serious about using their product. They're going to give it to you for free. But there are a couple that require you to pay, and there's, there's no reason to pay. That should be another bell that this is not a card reader that you want if you're being required to pay for your card reader. Again, contract. You shouldn't be signing a contract. There's plenty of them that do not require a contract, so why have a contract? You're going to get stuck in some of these have up to three-year contracts, which is ridiculous for, for such a simple thing that you don't need to do. So we looked at three. I looked at, I used Square and um, pay anywhere from uh, PayPal and Intuit Go payment systems this summer. I'm going to give you guys a more in-depth look at each one. The square reader is nice. A lot of people recognize and or actually ask, oh, do you have a square reader? So I think it's the most publicized one that's out there. People understand what square means when you say a card, card, card reader. So it has the best publicity. Um, it has a fairly high discount rate at 2.75% of each swipe purchase or $275 a month. And then it's a flat zero fee. It's just $275 a month. So the cutoff rate there is about $10,000 a month. So if you're doing more than $10,000 a month in sales, Square is a great choice for you. <laughs> but you're probably not doing that, right? I mean, unless you're a brick and mortar, maybe. I, um, so the service with Square is a little bit strange also. It's based off of a Twitter account. It, there, there's no phone support or email support with Square on their technical <laughs> sites and service. It's all run through Twitter, so if you're familiar with like hashtag language in Twitter, that's something that you might want to look into. It's kind of interesting how they do it, but I found it kind of cumbersome, and there's delayed responses um, for questions that we'd have. They would often tell you to look up a hashtag that's already a question they're answering, which is not uh, the immediate support that I have when I'm calling from a market and saying, my car reader doesn't work, you know, I need help figuring out. It doesn't, it doesn't really uh, sit well with me. Um, some of the little extra features that this has, that uh, has a slim design, which if you're using a, car or a case on your phone, is nice because you can put it onto your, your uh, um, iPhone if it has a case around it. Uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's just a nice little design. Um, I use cases on my phone, so I found that to be helpful, but it's not, you know, obviously not something that you're going to get sold on. Uh, the, one of the cool things about Square, though, is that it remembers your customers' credit cards when they're around you. And so if your phone is sitting at the farmer's market and you have customers that have purchased from you before or that have purchased from Square before or walking by, it'll automatically read their cards. And all they have to do is hit a little picture of themselves, basically, and it'll, it'll charge their accounts. But then they have to sign it, I should say. <laughs> I also used PayPal all summer long. Uh, we found that this one was kind of confusing with the pricing. Uh, there's a flat 2.77%, so a slightly less than square, or a 1.7%, but only if your customer is using their PayPal credit card, which we didn't run across anybody that uses a PayPal credit card all summer, so I don't know. I, yeah, the, it says 1.7% in its, in its uh, you know, publicity, but it, that's not real. Um, it does have great email, email support. You know, if, if anything is going wrong, um, PayPal has trust of clients. If they know it's going to be a secure purchase. There's that trust there that's just important. When people are handing you a credit card, there's a, there's a level of trust that needs to be had there. There's a lot of these credit card readers that nobody really knows about. They're hesitant, I think, to hand over their credit card. They're like, oh, yeah, here's a Rome Go payment system. They're like, Rome what? Um, and the one thing that I really liked about PayPal is that it allowed immediate access to the cash. So if I got paid at 400 bucks, let's say, at a, at a market, 
that day, I could get that $400 out after the market. Whereas on the other car rears, there's a delay up to three days sometimes on when you can get that cash out the, through the verification process. So that was the, the real redeeming factor with PayPal, I thought. But the one that I use most often is uh, Intuit Go Payment. Um, I'll try not to make an advertisement out of this. But I really enjoy this one. Um, it's a 2.75% flat rate uh, for swipe purchases, or $13 a month and 1.75% of swipes. So that pays off at about $1,500 a month in sales. So if you're doing, that's, that's generally a, you know, where I think that farmer's markets, you can find your, your uh, sweet spot in. We do at least $1,500 a month in credit card sales at farmer's markets during the summer. So it works out well for us to have that $13 a month. And actually, if you're using Intuit QuickBooks, uh, this system tracks all your purchases and your GPS locations and does all your taxes for you in your QuickBooks. So that's great for us, especially for a small business when we're so busy as is. I know you all are. It's great to have that little extra added uh, time that we don't have to spend on tracking our purchases. Um, and that $13 a month kind of disappears into your into our, our online QuickBooks subscription. So we have QuickBooks Online, we run it through that. And then if you run QuickBooks Online, that $13 becomes, I think, $5 a month is what the add-on is, depending on what time of the month you sign up for their service. They have all these promotions all the time. Um, again, their uh, free phone and email support, really good email support. And I just talked about the extras a little bit. So I will hand the mic over to Cecilia, and she will tell you all about the great things coming with uh, the business of organizing your farmer's market. I just wanted to uh, talk to you guys real quick about the necessity of taking credit card payments. I have a question. Is it easy to get in and out? I mean, if, you, if I wanted to try two or three of them, can you just back out of them right away? So, a couple slides, a couple slides back, there was uh, contracts. One of those, look at the ones that don't have contracts, and those are the ones that you can get in and out of really easy. You know, and, and that's, it goes a little bit, because once you sign up for like, a, like the Intuit $13 a month, you can sign up for different plans through Intuit that are different lengths of time. But most of them have an option of not signing a contract at all. Yep. So you can just look right there and use this as a reference off the MFMA website to discover which ones are easy to try out. Can I answer any other questions? No? Um, do you have a little more energy to look at a few more charts? And you don't have to take notes because guess what? All this information is where? <laughs> In the manual. Okay. Um, all right. Um, one of the uh, most frequently asked questions that uh, come into the MFMA either website or whatever is how to, um, uh, how to structure your farmer's market. Um, and I, what I will, it's, I don't know if the most frequently ignored answer, but, uh, I guess the point of this, uh, presentation is to, um, uh, let's see, it's to, uh, talk about the fact that, uh, farmers markets are, uh, on the radar more these days. There's, uh, increased scrutiny of farmers markets operations. And there's also, uh, with all of this comes increased liability. So what is the best way to, um, protect your farmers markets, your vendors, um, is by, um, creating a separate identity. And I know I've talked about this before. Uh, earlier today, but um, it's very important to distinguish your market from your vendors, from your board members, from your manager, from your volunteers. It's v very important these days. Um, create a professional operation. We've talked about that before. Uh, and of course, read the. In order to do that, you need to read the new farmers market manual and take the certification course, and you'll be well on your way. Um, so when we're talking about creating a structure for your market, uh, it is very. It was actually quite difficult to put everything in a format that um, was sort of more understandable and easy to follow. So this is what I've tried to do. Now there's a lot of information in these charts, but I think you will, you'll get the idea of what um, 
what we're going for here. So um, what I put on the top here are the, the, the organization, the type of organization that we're talking about, uh, and all the, the major things, the basic uh, items that you need in order to run that operation. Um, the first, and I know it's kind of small, but um, let's see. Okay, property insurance, personal liability insurance, vendor fees. Do you need a bank account? Do you need a manager? Uh, rules and regs, bylaws, and articles of incorporation or organization. So the first uh, kind of group that you can form is an informal vendor group. Uh, this is an unincorporated for-profit group. What does that mean? A bunch of uh, uh, three uh, uh, vendors get together, they decide to sell at a corner on a certain day, uh, every week, whatnot. But there's no formal organization, there's, there's nothing but just the idea that, that the decision that these people have um, to, to come together and sell at, a, at, a, at what they call a farmer's market. Well, um, you're going to need property insurance unless the, the parking lot that you're setting um, up on uh, the, the owner of that parking lot actually uh, provides or uh, the uh, property insurance for that. Either that or you're going to have to get it. You, have, you need personal liability insurance. You're probably going to need to collect some vendor fees and have some form of rules and regulations, but all of this stuff is, sometimes it's not um, something that these very informal vendor groups um, uh, take on. Um, the next level of organization would be a city-run program. It's obviously a nonprofit, it's a unit of government. Uh, property insurance is usually, you don't need that because usually the city's gonna take care of that. So this is a, as, as a market unit, you won't need to do that. Uh, but you do need, uh, each one of your vendors would be well advised to get the liability insurance, personal one. You're probably going to collect vendor fees. Uh, bank account usually is taken care of by the city itself. Uh, you probably do need a manager, but that might also be something the city does. And then you probably need regulations and some kind of a bylaw. But again, whenever you're working with a city, you're not, you're, you, you have to make an arrangement with the city, have some kind of an understanding between the vendors and the, and the city. Uh, the next level would be a vendor association, which is a for-profit association, but it's um, unincorporated. Um, so this could be, um, uh, so for this one, you would probably need um, a lot of these other things. The only thing you wouldn't need is the articles of the corporation. So you'd still, still have property insurance and vendor fees and accounts and manager regulations and bylaws and all that. Um, then the, the next level up would be a vendor association, but it's a for-profit uh, association, and that would require that you file articles of incorporation. And the last, oh, do I have, okay. So we're the same thing. Okay, one more is the low profit. Uh, that's called a, this is a new thing that's not quite legal in Minnesota yet, but it's called the 3L, the L3C is a low-profit, limited liability company. And what this company um, does is that it has to have a social enterprise component or a charitable component to, in addition to its profit um, uh, component. Uh, but as I said, it's not quite uh, um, the, uh, it, it hasn't been formalized or formally accepted in Minnesota yet. So, um, and the last one is a non-profit, which it would always be incorporated. So, I mean, if, I, if you had this in, in one chart, you'll see that, all that as, as you get more sophisticated in your structure, there are more requirements. But I think with those requirements come a greater uh, protection for each of your vendors and your market against uh, claims um, against you. So, um, all right, let me see the pros. So what I have here is the pros of all these different types of organizations that I just talked about. Informal, the city run, uh, vendor unincorporated, vendor incorporated, uh, low profit, and then non-profit. And I guess what I want to impress upon, I know this is very hard to read, but uh, I, I like this, <laughs> the whole list of pros from a city run uh, organization. Uh, so what are the, uh, I, I don't even know if I can read. Yes. 
Okay, so um, for a vendor association, either unincorporated or incorporated, is that? Oh, there would have been non-profit versus a for-profit. Okay, so... Yeah. That, the first thing would be taxes because a non-profit right is... But the other, the other benefit would be um, grants, the ability to receive grants. So, for example, when you have the pros of being your own informal association here, is, yeah, you're independent, you have minimal uh, managing costs, low budget, few rules, um, but the city run, you have a lot of advantages like the site and location uh, that's provided for you, they give you liability protection, uh, it's a low budget for your market because usually they cover some of the costs of running your market. Uh, the fiscal responsibility is on the, on the city itself and not on the market board or on the market vendors. Uh, you may attract grants because a lot of grants that are, are <coughs> given to units of government and not uh, Profit. Yes. Do you think there's anything that would make that easier for us to read? <laughs> I mean, we literally cannot read it. I know, time. I know, you can't. That's why I'm kind of going through it here. But you can, you could probably uh, put this up somewhere on the website. Uh, where's Kathy? All right. Yeah, we'll we'll make this available. You're right. Um, I guess the, the point. What did I do? He's doing it. <laughs> no, that's I, and that's as as much as I could uh, put. It. Sorry about that, but. Um, this will be on the manual. So um, I guess the, the, the bottom line too, there are certain, so even if we just enumerate the number of, of things that are, that are uh, the, the pros of a city run versus all the other ones, you can see that it's quite a, it, it speaks a lot for, for maybe approaching your city and saying, hey, can you uh, help us do this? It'll help us organize this market. Um, with a nonprofit, again, you, have, you would have some control because the vendors would create a board. Um, you have tax deductible donations. Uh, you have other tax, <coughs> tax breaks, liability protection. You may hire staff, attract more grants, easier to comply with tax requirements. So there's a lot of uh, advantages for a nonprofit. And then the other ones, when you talk about uh, vendor owned, then you get into a problem. Well, why would your farmer's market be an LLC? Who is the owner of that market? So maybe sometimes that, that might not make the best sense. Um, so then when we talk about uh, uh, what's not great, again, I think what, what is more important to see is here in the city run, there are not a whole lot of uh, cons <laughs> for that kind of uh, organization. Um, so what would be, some of them would be that you give up some of the control, maybe the vendors give some of the control, maybe they don't have quite as much of a say in the running of the market as they would wish. But I think the uh, pros really um, outweigh the cons, obviously. Um, the uh, major um, aspect against doing an informal and incorporated uh, structure for your farmer's market is again, uh, no legal protection, no liability protection, uh, and no tax breaks, uh, you have accounting challenges, you have a whole host of challenges that nowadays, I mean maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago was, was the way to go, but this, uh, in this day and age, that's a tough way to run a farmer's market. Um, especially since part of the, the, uh, the goal of farmers is there's the competition of all the other farmer's markets. Um, you, you know, you'd have to basically um, uh, try to make a different uh, entity than the other markets around your area. You need to stand out, and that way, that means that you're going to have to uh, apply for grants or uh, provide music and all that, and that brings with it so many accounting nightmares that that's something maybe that you don't want to do. Um, okay. We talk about a little bit about the, I don't know this is a lot of information, but again, I think part of the, the point here <laughs> And this is all part of the, the market manual and all the steps that you need to take if you're starting a market or you are um, maintaining a market. Uh, we've tried to put together a checklist of all the items that you need in order to run a well-operated professional farmer's market. And hopefully we haven't conduct, uh, um, missed anything. But so there's a, a planning stage and all the things that go into the planning stage. I'm not going to go through those. 
then the EBT, if you want to provide EBT credit and debit, uh, there's a whole list of things that you need to uh, uh, get done. And this is what I was talking about, all the uh, links that are in the, um, in the manual. It's, uh, some of the checklists are going to look like this. Um, development stage, things like create a business plan, and there's, when we say create a business plan, there's going to be a, another link to an actual sample business plan, drop a budget, there is a link to a sample business, uh, to a budget, uh, decide on the accounting methods, uh, decide employee payroll, severe weather protocol, musician agreement on file, all those things that you probably never thought you had to get, uh, or that you had to, to think about, um, it's all here. Um, active stage, join the Chamber of Commerce, register with the Minnesota Department of Ag, uh, recruit vendors, design, um, then the market season stage uh, where you hold your meetings, you go through different uh, safety protocols, volunteers, things like that, and then risk management. Um, I don't know why that came out smaller than the rest of them. Um, we talk about uh, insurance needs and other um, risk needs. Okay, so then the, one of the more exciting parts of the manual, I think, is this, uh, the forms that are going to be included either at the, in the packet, in the, like the farmer's market packet that you, you get if you buy the printed copy, or uh, the links that will be provided for the, um, uh, and the online uh, manual. And there are things like sample bylaws, articles of organization of a corporation, the SD19, so that you can go through the list and go check, 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 check. Oh, I don't have this one. Okay, I gotta get this one, but I know how to get it. So by the end of it, let's see. Uh, okay, so let's see. Canopy safety, uh, accident report form, um, sample sponsorship letter, uh, 1099s, W2s, W4s, 990s, uh, insurance policy information, sample vendor application, sample manager application, sample board position description, uh, board application, everything is in there. So the, the goal is to have your market run uh, like an efficient business operation um, and in compliance. And, um, but we've done the work for you, putting all this together so you can achieve what you want without having to do all the research yourself from the get-go. So I know this is a lot of information, um, but I uh, just want to give you a, a taste of what's in the, uh, in the manual. So, if you have any questions. Yes, yes. I just have a comment to make in my cynical self. Having a city-run farmer's market that yes. can pull the plug on you at any time if they have That's budget true. problems. Right, and so what you want to do is drop uh, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, which is also included in the, in the packet there. <laughs> and uh, that might, you know, help you. Because, well, yeah, of course, help absolutely. You until they have a new budget here. And then right. when off, everything gets redone. Exactly. So the, how to deal with that. Uh, do the, the, the market maybe does its own fundraising. Vendor fees cover their own thing. So, for example, for our market, we're a city. We're just starting the process of formalizing our city relationship. Uh, but we are bringing to the the city council the proposition, that, the proposal that we are going to be a self-sufficient market. We're not going to be a line item budget, um, uh, a line in their budget. We're going to be our own self-sufficient entity. But what we need from them is uh, the, the the fiduciary. Uh, part of, of the whole thing because I, I can't take care of accounting. I don't know how to do accounting. I don't know how to do payroll or anything like that, right? So I want them to have that responsibility and I want them to take care of insurance liability and all that kind of stuff, but, and I want to run the market. That's what I want to do. Does that make sense? Yep, thank no. you. Okay. Anything else? or any of your markets had uh, personal experience filing for a uh, 501c3, a c4, c5, c5. No, okay, in crux, 501c, 501C, do you know which number? Three, I believe. Three. 
So as a charitable organization, tax exempt. Okay. Now, how long were you waiting for that? Are you still waiting from the IRS? No, we have it for several years. Wow. Well, again, congratulations. <laughs> Okay, from from my experience that I've heard about, um, it usually is taking about a year for these farmers markets between when they submit all of their stuff to get a C three and to get the. Uh, to we have a very good treasurer that's in the chamber office, and she does all our paperwork for us. And she did real well for us. Yeah, it's good to have friends, eh? Yes, it is. Terry, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to say, we, we have one, and it took about a year to get it. But I do understand now, for smaller organizations, um, you can apply online for a $200 fee, and everything is basically done online. So you don't have to go through the send up and everything else. I don't know if that's completely online by the IRS, but that's what I Now, so Terry, would that uh, $200 fee be in addition to the other fees for filing? Okay, so if it's a small organization, they kind of cut you a break. Interesting. Now, has anyone here ever worked with a fiscal agent, uh, a company that, or excuse me, foundation perhaps, that is a 501c3 and kind of a launders money for you. Oh, you have? Okay. What has your experience been with a fiscal agent? And uh, the Grand Rapids Farmers Market had moved to do as, as a C6, and then we've now decided to do it with a C5. So. As you can see, it's just a lot of different C's out there. Um, now, uh, well, the difference between the different C's depends. C3 is your sort of, yeah, gold standard. Uh, the rest of them uh, are um, tax-exempt organizations, but donations to you are not tax-exempt. So if you had ABC Foundation that wanted to give you some money, that would not be a tax write-off form. But if you were a C3, it would be. And so it's a lot of times that's why my, my market works with a fiscal agent in order to take donations. It also limits your grants. It very much does limit your grants. Now, is there anyone here who is a C6 or a C5? Okay. All right, well, I just kind of wanted to, to kind of pull out there and see what, uh, what folks were organized at. Yes? Um, I just want to make a comment on the C5 status. I'm from the Grand Rapids Farmers Market also, and uh, I think there was some misinformation put out about it in one of the manuals that's out there. It wasn't the Minnesota one. I think it was Vermont, but they said that the C5 status prohibits you from having any non-farmers in your organization, but that's actually not true. If you look at the IRS descriptions of the C5, you can have non farmers in your organization as long as your organization is for the betterment of farmers. All right. <coughs> yeah, see, there, there's a, a chart that the Farmers Market Coalition has on four of these with the pros, with the pros and cons. One of the basic differences is C3 cannot engage in any political activity whatsoever. C4, C5, C6, uh, can, can uh, engage in limited political activity, which includes trying to get laws changed, where threes cannot. We were we were originally a six. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the NFL is also a 501 C6. And uh, that's usually trade organizations. We finally became a Chamber five, of which is the same as uh, labor unions and agricultural organizations. C5 and Jane can explain to you what happened. She she spent some time on the phone with an IRS agent. They basically approved us on the phone, no fee. We want to get it formalized. We'd have to pay like 850 bucks because of our throughput because of our SNAP and credit card sales. But there's no need to because there's no advantage to having it formalized. In the state of Minnesota, just uh, you just 
by your Articles of Incorporation as what, whatever federal one you want to be. And, and uh, you're basically all, they're all lumped together. And you have to go through the state first. Was there, did you have a question? Uh, actually, more comment. of a, a comment. I, would, I work for a public health department, and there's um, a state health improvement fund state health improvement program funding that is currently within the state and it's available to all counties within the state and one of the um, there's six areas that they're focusing on and one is healthy food environments and communities and one of the pieces within that there's you know they've got kind of a menu of things but one of the things that they are focusing on is facilitate the development of new farmers markets and promote their use so I would encourage everybody to call your local public health department. Um, the money is either in a planning grant or an implementation grant. And some counties are like multi-county um, working together. But you, it, would, it would be a good thing just to call and say, what's going on with the state health improvement program? And is there any way that we can work more closely with you? With, with the idea that they could help you get organized as a uh, specific tax yeah. exempt organization or something like that. Well, it can, so it's facilitate the development of new ones or promote their use. So each public health department is currently working on their plan right now. And so it's, I would just check in with them to see if they're doing anything with farmers markets. A lot of it is based on a community health assessment of what's going on and kind of it's, it's driven at the local level. So just a thought. Drew, um, I'm curious what your ballpark estimates would be of farmers markets in Michigan being organized as C3, C4, C6, LLCs? In Michigan, about a third of our farmers markets are um, operate as part of their local government. Um, about another third operate as part of a local um, like economic or community development organization. Um, so that's the, in Michigan, that's the majority. Many of them have either um, like sponsor agreements or MOUs um, where they're kind of operating and they, uh, many of them can see support from those organizations, even minimally if it's a thousand dollars or something like that. And then the other third is a wide variety, um, 501, <coughs> a fewer 501c3s. Most 501c3s must have an educational component and so most of our farmers markets that are 501c3s operate as part of a community organization like the Allen Neighborhood Center that is doing a lot of great work and their farmer's market is just one part of their food access work. Um, and other than that, then there's a sort of slide that did not last third of, um, not, we don't get a lot of fours um, or sixes, but I think people are starting to do this. Yes, sir. Uh, I said in the board of a C3 for another organization and uh, the organization's kind of been collecting a lot of money through different activities. The bank balance got up to about 45000 and the IRS really looks at you. you got to start spending money. They don't want you to stock market. So we had to hire some speakers to do other things for an education <laughs> program. But you, you can't just sit on money. I mean, that's one of the well, that, I, I was applying for a grant earlier this year, and someone told me, this is a little off topic, topic, but someone told me, look, Jesse, these organizations, by law, have to by their own bylaws have to give away money. So if you find a program that actually works within their guidelines, you're doing them a favor. So apparently I wasn't doing a good enough favor for them, but <laughs> live and learn. Um, are there any other uh, comments? Yes, dear. Yeah, you have on uh, here one of the questions that you often get is, is our market manager and employer is independent contractor? Um, <clears throat> this is another I, I know <laughs> Cecilia and I have been like, just read the manual. But um, yes, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. There's a, uh, in there, um, and this is going to be in the chapter resources. So this is something on the website that you will be, be able to look at uh, for free. Um, it's a 20 question list of what makes an independent car contractor. And it's really quite surprising because, you know, I think a lot of, market managers who are lucky enough to actually get, receive compensation are paid as independent contractors. Well, if, if you tell an independent contractor they have to be, uh, you know, at a certain place at a certain time doing a certain thing, well, they're they're an employee, and uh, you'll you end up finding those sort of things biting you in the rear. Uh, uh, especially, you might get someone who then 
files for unemployment. You know, uh, or, or, or an intern, you know, if you don't go by the uh, intern guidelines where you're, you're providing education and you're not replacing an actual job with the internship, you could, if someone wanted to, you know, get, get you in a lot of hot water. So, unfortunately, you know, these are things that we really have to, to pay attention to whether we like it or not. Now, I've got to have... I can't hold my own cards for myself. We've got three more minutes. Um, uh, is there anything else, or, or should we? Uh, yes, dude. I, in following up what um, someone behind me was talking about the SHIP program, mm -hmm. thanks to our nice county health, public health, we got a grant from SHIP for our sign. Mm -hmm. It's a sandwich board, beautifully made. It was almost $500. Wow. Only paid for my snap. And the city lets by, by ship. Ship. Yeah. <laughs> so many acronyms, I know. Yeah. Um, but the city lets us keep it up all summer. And we're on a major Excellent. So all week, everyone is looking at the sign saying, come back Saturday morning. Well, that's, awesome. that's great. Very fortunate. Yeah, because a lot of cities on those thoroughfares are not so... Uh, they're so amenable to that. Well, that was this year. Who knows what they're going to do. But we're on city property. We are too, but yet we are not allowed to put a sign anywhere in town. Really? Well, they just made a new sign ordinance. We have the state highway department in our town, so the state <laughs> sign guy is in our town. So yeah. he runs around and picks up signs and don't tell you where they went. Yeah, uh -huh. They just disappear. So you think you got a sign thief out there. Here they are all stacked up with the state highway department. <laughs> Oh. They better not take my sign. <laughs> well, well, we're we're by your we have a city oh. Well, folks, um, Bill is going to introduce our uh, uh, next speakers, and this is going to be some information that a lot of us are going to want to know, and, and we are looking forward to asking some good questions, too. So uh, go ahead and build. Thank you, Jesse. All right, to close out the day, we're going to have a presentation about SNAP at Minnesota Farmers Markets, a 2013 <laughs> update. And uh, David Nicholson, from uh, who's a SNAP Community Outreach Specialist with the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Uh, Donna Hagemeyer, Income Maintenance Program Advisor, Minnesota Department of Human Services. And Sue Laterno, Health Improvement Project Manager with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And Jesse is also going to sit in on this. Come on up, folks, and uh, good luck. So um, first I want to say thanks, Bill, for the introduction. Thanks to the Minnesota Farmers Market Association for inviting us to speak today a little bit about um, the SNAP program and the EBT and um, uh, Farmers Market, or the EBT and Market Box Initiative at Farmers Markets here in Minnesota. I'm David Nicholson. Right now I coordinate the EBT and Market Box program through the uh, Department of Human Services. How's this better? Oh yeah, that is much better. Now I can hear myself. <coughs> Um, so I coordinate the uh, EBT and Market Bucks program through the Department of Human Services. Uh, the program itself is funded by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota, um, as is my position at the Department of Human Services. Um, there's already been a lot said today about the SNAP program generally and about how SNAP works at farmers markets. So let me just say this, I, um, I'll touch on that a little bit on and off, but I think the important thing that I want you to know is I brought a bunch of business cards, um, and if you want to pick the business cards up, if you have questions about SNAP or how to do EBT at your farmer's market, pick one of them up because I'm always available to answer questions, to hold your hand. There are a lot of steps for farmer's markets to take if they want to implement EBT uh, at their markets, um, and some of the steps can be a little bit more of a headache than others, uh, but we are here to help and, uh, and happy to do so. Um, let me talk a, a little bit, start out by saying, uh, give a little history of the program here in Minnesota. 
uh, I think it was back in 2009 or something like that, uh, um, there began to be talk about creating, um, actually let me take even one step further back, because I do want to credit the Minnesota Farmers Market Association with taking uh, one of the first steps to make uh, EBT a reality here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, in 2008, the Minnesota, Depa or Minnesota Farmers Market Association, with the help of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, applied for a specialty crop improvement grant that would have then purchased or helped farmers markets purchase the card reader machines, wireless card reader machines, to facilitate uh, EBT purchases at farmers markets. And I think that that grant would have allowed 12 markets uh, to uh, accept EBT. So that was really a first big push, and I think there were a lot of lessons learned around that experience, not the least being that um, uh, purchasing card reader machines is an important first step, um, but there's a lot more support that's needed by farmers markets in order to make um, uh, EBT successful at the market. Um, based on, to some extent, observations around that experience, uh, sometime in 2009, uh, there, was, there were a bunch of people actually in d different pockets thinking about, so uh, how can we encourage markets to um, accept EBT payments and also give them the support that they need, and also uh, encourage sufficient numbers of SNAP uh, participants to actually shop at the farmers markets to make uh, the, all the work worthwhile. Uh, Blue Cross was approached uh, to that end to provide support for markets interested in uh, accepting EBT uh, and also to create a uh, incentive program. Um, Drew talked about the, um, the double up um, Thank you. Double Up Food Bucks program. In Minnesota, we created the program called uh, the Market Bucks program. And again, that was conceived in 2009, uh, finally launched in 2010 season. Um, th at the same time that Blue Cross was talking about developing that incentive, I know that there was a whole bunch of, the SHIP program has been talked about here, the statewide health improvement program. There were lots of health departments around the state who were also thinking about incentive programs and helping markets implement um, EBT. Uh, notably, as far as this initiative is concerned, uh, the Minneapolis Health Department uh, was making a strong uh, push to get EBT at more markets, and ultimately, uh, Blue Cross, the city of Minneapolis, and um, three farmers markets in Minneapolis uh, launched that first pilot um, to try out an incentive program and also to implement EBT in two new markets. Um, I should make one other note that I should have said before. In Minnesota, the first market to offer EBT or accept EBT payments was the Midtown Farmers Market. Miguel is here from the Midtown Farmers Market. They started their program in 2006. Um, and they were um, really the uh, one of those three pilot markets testing out the incentive, the Market Box Incentive Program. So um, there were lots of conversations going on. Those conversations began, at least as far as this initiative is, is concerned, with the city of Minneapolis and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, in the following year, um, we reached out to the Rochester downtown farmers market, which had already developed their own, already implemented EBT and developed their own incentive program with the support of Olmsted uh, County Public Health uh, and invited them to the initiative. And I believe it was in that same year that the Minnesota Farmers Market again uh, wrote a grant to, um, to help markets secure uh, wireless card reader machines. And uh, we approached them and said, you guys do the card reader machines, but we'd like to work with you uh, with this incentive program and some of the other support that we can offer to help markets implement as well. So we added the Minnesota Farmers Market Association to uh, this group of um, folks trying to get more EBT in markets. I, th I think the story that I really want to tell here is that the development or the extension of EBT in Minnesota was kind of a very, uh, uh, it was a very organic pr process. It wasn't especially planful. Um, and um, uh, it ended up at a certain point becoming difficult because at least to have a, s a strong statewide message because it really ended up being 
kind of four separate hubs of EBT activity in Minnesota, um, each with their own little differences or partic particular idiosyncrasies, which um, not were bad, but again, made it difficult to talk in a very powerful way about the benefits of um, farmers markets and the availability of EBT at farmers markets and uh, uh, in matching incentive program at those markets. To that end, uh, to, or to try to address that, there was discussion about creating sort of a central administrator uh, for uh, EBT in the state of Minnesota. And that administrator, for a variety of reasons, uh, became the Department of Human Services. Um, that was on that recognition. Uh, part of the initiative, though, the visible part of the initiative is, is EBT at farmers markets and the markets bucks program. There's kind of a hidden part of the initiative as well, which has to do with thinking about the organizational and technological infrastructure which uh, could better support uh, farmers markets uh, acceptance of EBT. And uh, there was a group convened as part of the initiative in 2011. Um, the Minnesota Farmers Market Association was represented in that group by uh, Diana Bushko, who was the previous staff person, and then Terry uh, here was also in that group. And we uh, did a lot of talking about what the ideal system would look like uh, to do a better job of uh, implementing EBT in Minnesota. And uh, one of their recommendations, too, was to try to centralize the administrative functions of uh, EB uh, surrounding EBT to the extent possible to make it more efficient. Um, so here we are today. Uh, if you've heard anything about the 2013 season, which was the first season that we really tried this experiment of having a central administrator. Uh, you might have heard that it was a complicated season. Um, but I think that uh, we've done a lot this year uh, from based on your feedback and also based on our own observations and where we, where we thought we needed to go all along to try to make some improvements. I'll talk a little bit about those and I think Sue will talk a little bit more about them in a minute. But if, if you've heard funny things, they're probably true. Um, but I don't want those funny things to color the opportunities that there really are in participation in the program or in implementing EBT at your farmers markets. Um, so that's kind of a super brief uh, history of EBT uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, a little more specifically about how the program works here in Minnesota, how the initiative works. and. Uh, uh, and what we've covered, at least in the past, and hope to cover in upcoming seasons, what types of uh, funding support we have. Um, and I'm just going to read off my list here. Um, the first is that we have funds and materials to support the Market Box Incentive Program. Uh, we have informational material to distribute to consumers and to other community partners. We help markets purchase market signs. We provide technical assistance for implementing and developing a strategy for sustaining EBT and for outreach efforts. Funds to help with staffing costs associated with implementing and uh, managing EBT at the markets. Uh, and funds for uh, certain equipment and supplies, like token purchases, for example, or a tent for a central market booth. Uh, in exchange for that, there is contract rigmarole. Uh, remember, the Department of Human Services um, is under some scrutiny by both the state legislature uh, and by taxpayers in the end. So we have to have all our I's dotted and all our T's crossed, and the contracting process with you all um, is part of doing that. Um, we hope to dras dramatically thin down the contracting process for this upcoming season, just by the by. Um, our Market Bucks program here, our matching incentive program, is uh, a little bit different than the one Drew described for Michigan. Um, it's only a $5 match. It's a $5, up to a $5 match every time um, a SNAP customer comes and visits the market. Um, so really they could visit a different market every day um, and get an additional $5 on their card. I don't know if $5 is the, the magic match number. I don't know if $20 is the magic match number. Um, what I do know is that uh, um, we've seen that Market Bucks is a very successful program in increasing SNAP participation and SNAP purchases at uh, farmers markets. Um, let me see. I'm skipping through a lot of stuff since it's already been covered elsewhere, and I want to leave lots of time for questions. 
at the end here. Oh, the other significant difference with the Market Bucks program, uh, Drew mentioned that in Michigan, uh, their um, matching incentive can only be used to purchase Michigan-grown fruits and vegetables. In Minnesota, the uh, Market Bucks can be used to purchase uh, any SNAP eligible item. So the, the same things that a customer would be accustomed to using their SNAP funds to use to purchase at grocery stores and whatnot, um, they can purchase those same items if they're available at farmers markets. Um, I'll say briefly, uh, if you've participated in the program in the past and are interested in improvements for the upcoming year, uh, for one, we know that we need to do a better job of uh, listening to the participant markets. So we'll be creating an advisory. I'll be sending stuff out about that um, shortly. And so we'll be asking your help and helping us think about the things that we're doing a little bit more. Um, as I already mentioned, we're reducing the application packet and contract by half. If you're a returning market, you won't have to resubmit all the paperwork that you, that you had to submit uh, the first round. So that should make it a lot, uh, a lot easier. Um, let's see. Uh, some of the covered expenses will change. Uh, evaluation reporting requirements we hope will be reduced. Um, and um, I think we're going to try to do a much better job. We heard actually through the Minnesota Farmers Market Association survey that was done and through some of uh, the feedback that we've gotten ourselves. We need to do a much better job uh, with outreach and promotion. So we're trying to, we're going to try to put a lot more emphasis on that during this year. The other improvement that we hope to continue working on is the holy grail of changing and improving the technology around uh, delivering EBT at farmers markets. Um, I think that about sums for me. Like I say, I, I want to leave a lot of room for questions at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Sue, who's going to talk a little bit more about the program from Blue Cross as I go. I don't know about you guys, but I think we should be singing and dancing up here. <laughs> who's tired? <laughs> I don't know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go for it. I don't say, I dance, but... Sue, I would dance with you, but... Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have also uh, been known to wear costumes and do goofy things, so... Um, but I'm a little more serious today. Uh, it's been a long day and a really uh, rich day, and I really want to uh, thank uh, Jesse and Kiati uh, for inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, we really consider that uh, the Minnesota Farmers Market Association as a real key partner in our efforts uh, to increase uh, consumption of fruit and vegetables and other healthy foods uh, that are grown locally here in Minnesota. It's very, very uh, key and important to our efforts um, for a healthier Minnesota. I, uh, I think I, I don't want to repeat some of the things that uh, David said, but I do want to acknowledge again that uh, this, well, and I can say I'm new. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have only been on staff uh, for about six months, and I come actually from uh, after nine years at Extension uh, in their, as their health and nutrition program leader um, and operated the uh, SNAP, ed, uh, SNAP education program uh, through their nutrition education around the state of Minnesota. So I have some you know, background with the audience, uh, if you will, and uh, also with uh, the bureaucracies of the USDA and the Food and Nutrition Service um, by submitting our... Um, SNAP Ed uh, grant every year. Uh, but I also come, I think, um, you know, being new, I, I recognize and want to acknowledge that this is, you know, this idea that was conceived to create a uh, central administrator and to contract with DHS has been uh, less than ideal. Uh, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, I take no credit for it because I wasn't around, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, we, you know, we are making significant improvements um, just in terms of bringing uh, the culture of uh, DHS, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and, and uh, farmers markets uh, together is, is a, a bit challenging at, at best. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but uh, hearing from Drew and looking at the uh, potential sales, um, even and even uh, Drew acknowledging how much opportunity there is uh, in Michigan despite their uh, extreme success. I don't want us to be fit. We're fifth out of six days in the Midwest in terms of, uh, or we were 2012. I'm hoping that we come out a little bit better in 2000, or excuse me, 2000, 
uh, 13, I hope that we come out a little bit better. We were, as you saw on Drew's slide, $149,000 of uh, sales uh, in EBT. And so um, I know that uh, we need to be at least above average. I wanted uh, to acknowledge, um, we, you know, we learned something along the way um, with the central administrator model, um, and we continue to learn that. And I want to uh, thank Jesse for putting the survey out. Uh, we did, uh, you know, really learned a lot from the feedback that you gave th uh, through the survey. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, you know, we, we heard about how people are seeing that uh, having EBT and uh, market bucks at their market has increased, you know, from, their, from your standpoint, has increased your sales. Uh, but we also hear um, uh, some of the issues, um, some of the uh, requests for additional technical assistance, uh, additional uh, help with, uh, with the uh, promotion, uh, getting people there. And I want to say um, uh, we also have a couple of other things in the works here in terms of learning this year about this year's market. Uh, it was kind of a weird market year anyway. I mean, things were delayed and, uh, and the you know, growing season was delayed. There was you know, a lot of things that were kind of slow to start anyway. But um, we are uh, conduct. We have conducted a, a formal evaluation. Uh, we have interviewed uh, participants in the program. We've interviewed uh, vendors. Uh, we've, uh, we are in the process of conducting uh, interviews uh, with uh, farmer market managers, uh, with other key stakeholders. We are also uh, conducting some focus groups with um, SNAP uh, participants who have not uh, participated in the Farmers Market <coughs> Program because we know we want to really um, increase participation. And uh, we, are, uh, we will have the uh, results of this uh, formal evaluation uh, in January. And we intend to use both um, the feedback we're getting from, from all of you as uh, members from uh, our formal evaluation and from uh, SNAP participants to uh, make the program much better uh, in the coming year. Um, I think I just want to just point to a couple of things for um, what I do know about uh, for 2014. Uh, as with any organization, you know, we are going through a budgeting process and uh, we have to, you know, submit our proposals and the big wigs get to decide, you know, what, so what's spent, uh, what we can spend money on. But uh, we do fully intend to um, contract with uh, DHS again to, uh, to provide the contracts to um, markets and to provide the technical assistance and the funds uh, to um, help support the markets. Uh, we are um, also, I really want to emphasize that our organization wants, we want this to be a win-win. Uh, we want uh, SNAP participants to go to markets to buy things and to eat things. We want uh, this to be a uh, successful and um, profitable venture for markets and vendors. Uh, we really want to get, so it's, in order for that to happen, we have got to get more SNAP participants to the markets. Some of the markets um, have experienced growth. Some of the newer markets had very low participation. This is you know, anecdotally right now, we don't have all the data yet, but from the, uh, some of what we've heard from uh, a few of the markets, uh, they just didn't see people come. And so it is incumbent on us to uh, put resources towards a, a really uh, broad scale outreach uh, effort. Um, in some ways, I think the, that we tried to grow this too fast. Uh, we wanted, you know, we're, we're going to just get EBT everywhere. And we really needed to build some more infrastructure. To, so that this, this program and initiative is built on a firm foundation and that we need to be able to put systems in place um, to reach the uh, customers for you. And so um, we will be, as an organization, we will, we will be focusing on that much more than growth. And so our um, expansion of the program is going to be limited, um, limited in the coming year. And I, you know, I don't know exactly what that number will be. We'll have that available when, when we put out the um, uh, packet to um, current and uh, potential markets. Uh, but just please know that we really want you to be engaging in a success, successful venture, not uh, something that is going to be a lot of work for very little uh, payback. 
uh, I think, I don't know, I just I could, um, the other thing, and we mentioned, and I think Drew did a really nice job, it's really important for us to do um, more partnerships with <laughs> our extension folks, um, with SNAP outreach, uh, for, with Head Start and the CAP agencies. We, need, we really need to engage um, really creatively around uh, getting people that are already um, working with, with SNAP participants and helping, uh, getting their help in terms of getting, the market, uh, getting them to the markets. Um, I think the, other, the only other thing, I'll, uh, and I'll turn it over to Donna, is that uh, I think we, you know, we had a meeting last week actually um, with uh, a few folks from, uh, from the organization and it was a really positive, uh, very uh, positive meeting. I think we really uh, plan to work um, more, more on our relationship and partnership and I think it's a really, really important and I look forward to it. So I'll turn it over to Donna to talk about how do you get this stuff? Hi, um, I'm Donna Hagmeyer and I work at the Department of Human Services. Um, I just wanted to kind of explain why I work with administering the USDA grant funds and not David. Um, I work in a unit that um, deals mostly with benefits and issuance of cash and food programs at the state of Minnesota. So that would be your SNAP, your MFIP, your GA programs, those type. And we deal with any issues related to um, the administration of those benefits. So if it's whether it's cash, direct deposit, or EBT. So that is how we got assigned to administer the funds. Um, you probably all heard about in, back in 2012, the USDA allocated certain funds to each state to encourage farmers markets to start accepting SNAP benefits and in return they would reimburse you for the cost of your point of sale machine and um, if there's application fees involved and then the monthly wireless fees for that season. And so um, I started doing that in January. Um, in 2012 we had one farmers market sign up. And in 2013, we've had 15 so far. Uh, yes, and I think some of them are here. Um, the funds were going to um, end this September, this past September. Uh, they had been carried over from 2012 to 2013, and they were going to end this past September. And we just got word in October that those funds will be extended, whatever we have remaining, to uh, September 30th of 2014. So if you haven't signed up to be a SNAP authorized um, provider, um, you can start, you can still do that, and you can do it like today if you want. Um, are there any farmers markets here that are not currently accepting SNAP? Oh, so about, about 10 of 10. So um, if you don't have a, a point of sale machine to accept SNAP and you are interested in doing that, uh, you can email me and my name is, uh, it's Donna, D-O-N-N-A, dot Hagemeyer, H-A-G-E-M-E-I-E-R, and it's at, at state dot M-N dot U-S. And the process will be, um, you need to find a third-party processor. Uh, we don't require a certain one. You can choose your own. It can be wired or wireless for the POS. Then once you get an agreement or a contract, you'll want to email me that contract or agreement. And at that time, I will look at what the expenses are and what we can reimburse. And then at that time, I will notif or I will send you the DHS grant contract that we do require you to sign. It, it, it only has to be signed by 
either the market manager or whoever is, you know, is authorized to sign it. You don't, there's a spot there for an attorney, but you don't have to have an attorney unless you want. Um, it's, it's kind of a boilerplate contract that we do have to have signed. Um, once we get that back, then I will submit your um, expenses to our accounting department for reimbursement. And it's a one-time payment. So if, let's say, if your market is done now for this season and you purchase a, a POS and uh, some expenses will be for the 2014 season, I'll need to know what the months that you operate your, your market. And then we will um, reimburse you for the monthly wireless fees for those months, even though they haven't occurred yet. So if it's like May through October, we'll reimburse you for the monthly wireless fees for those months in that one-time check. Um, oh, you do have to get certified by FNS before to be a SNAP market, so. Any other questions? I was going to add on that it has to be a farmer's market specific FNS number. Right. Right. It can't be farm stall, farm stand. Yes, it does have Individual to be a farmers, farmer's market farmer's certified. Market yeah. FNS right. Yes? What is the, maybe it's late in the day, I'm not getting it. What is the third party process? Um, that would be who would provide you your services for access, you know, for running the card through. Such as? Um, merchant services, um, I, I don't know. Wells Fargo, you can do it through your bank. Right, right. So it's a credit card or a bank. Right, right. Yeah. right. I'm sorry. Yes. Ask the merchants in your town. Don't have ideas. Thank you. And we have really, sorry to butt in here, guys. No. We had really good luck with our local bank that we just have our checking account. They're a state bank, and they um, had a backup machine for us. They were just two blocks away. We had a question. Yep. They gave us an intern over the top three months uh, to work the machine. So reaching out to a local bank can kind of be a win-win because you know they they can maybe put up a little poster and they're doing good for the community. But uh, and, and a lot of them. Can I, can I kind of hold your hand? And so you've had experiences with people that are able to process EBT transactions? Yes. Yes. Our, we, our bank market did the exact same thing. World. And I would assume their fees might be less than dealing with a third party credit card. And if you're a nonprofit, sometimes they cut you a little deal. Yeah. Um, and just um, to also let you know, we do not reimburse for transaction fees. So that is. Um, something that you would incur as part of the expense of accepting SNAP. Yes? Um, how easy is it, is it to change the certified market that you just made? Like if you like sign up for the FS number um, okay. under a certain organization, but I think what you're asking is, okay, you have an FNS number at one farmer's market and you want to participate in a different market? Because if you, if you split off, we did have somebody that way, where they were a single stall farmer's market under one FNS certification, and then they went to a multi stall uh, um, market, they had to get a new FNS number. You can't, you can't take it from market to market. So right now, our market is a project of a nonprofit. The market might become its own nonprofit. So the FNS number currently would have to be under our nonprofit, but if the market were to become its own independent organization, it would need to reapply for its number, correct? You know, I, I would refer you to FNS. Because it's really their their rules and, and how they process that. So I don't wanna speak on their behalf. But if you if you're certified with F and S to take SNAP, then you can apply to, for reimbursement for the, the uh, point of sale machine and the monthly wireless fees. Yeah. As long as you haven't gotten it already. Yeah. Oh yes.
teaching of all the different virtue providers, so that all of us are doing that, yeah. and we can get it done at one, yeah. you know, one thing. Does that make sense? I'll let David speak to that. We put out an RFP. So Kathy, um, likewise, uh, there's a little bit of reluctance on the part of DHS to do that type of RFP. I would say too, that's probably the better way than doing a survey, just because you know I mean there are hundreds of different um, options for. Well, I should ask, Mar Margaret, would that be would that be good for you? Yeah. Kind of put yeah. Team Woo! Team for you? Okay. I would, I would say, too, there's already some information. Maybe, Drew, you'd be willing to forward your information, uh, or we can find it on your website. Um, there's also been some work done around that, some research done by the Farmers Market Coalition. Suzanne Briggs, I know, did a survey at one time for them on that. Um, the hard thing about putting it all in a spreadsheet is because uh, is. Uh, the merchant services providers or third-party processors or whatever you want to call them are very, uh, um, they do a really good job of, of construing their fees in a variety of different ways that make them very hard to compare to one another. Um, so it's not as easy as, it's, as it sounds to put a spreadsheet like that together. Um, but it's certainly worth, I think the RFP thing would be something to look into. I want to, oh, just within Sarah. Um, Grand Rapids Market, we went to our bank, we already, uh, first year we went to a market services provider that <coughs> was kind of affiliated with the, the MFMA program at the time. And then uh, we started talking to our bank, they provided us an intern to staff our booth during the summer months, uh, they did a few other things, we went to them and they said, Tried, we tried to use them first. They didn't think they, could, they didn't know how to do it. Then they decided they knew how to do it. <laughs> this year, we, we switched over to them. We have lower fees. I think our transaction fees are averaging around 2% for, for credit card swipe. They bought us two point of sale machines. One stays at the bank in case ours goes down. And they do go down. Machines have a tendency to become doorstops at the lead. At, most inopportune <laughs> moments, okay, and they're not cheap. So, and uh, they also provided us, you know, our banking and, and, and help and an intern. So, the message I want to say is go out to your, your local bank, the option, we may, there may be an answer there for you at, at the local level. I particularly like it in our market because it's our lo a local state bank they have a community service uh, part of the asset of, of, their, of their bank, and that's how they're doing it. And uh, fees are cheaper, everything's cheaper, and it, it's working out great. That's that's the that's the rec the first recommendation that we make at the Department of Human Services is to start with your bank. You should shop around, and I also have a list of questions that we think are important to ask that can help guide you in uh, your search. Um, but it is important to be thoughtful, careful, and give yourself time to make a considered choice when you're looking for a third-party processor, merchant services provider, card services provider, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, uh, I think Sarah actually had a question first, and then uh, Barb, I'll come back to it. Well, I'm just coming across because merchant services, this is our first year doing it, and I'm just coming across an issue where our representative that we deal with at merchant services is telling me that, yeah, we have no fees for seasonal closure. We have no problem with seasonal closure because your market's seasonal. You have monthly fees that you sign your contract and you got that seasonal thing going. And all of, a, all of a sudden, they call you and say, wait, you just closed your account. You can only 
only close your account for six months. If it's longer than six months, you have to reapply to reopen it. And if you're going May 15th to October 15th, you're right on that six months like we are. And I had them reopen it and recharge with stuff. And now they're calling saying what's going on. And I'm really dealing with a mess there. Does anybody know those murky, muddy waters? Is it seasonal clothes? Is it um, I, it varies by merchant service or by service provider, but think of um, think of shopping for a provider as like shopping for a cell phone. Like you need to find someone to provide you with service, and you also need to provide to find someone to provide you with a machine. And the terms are all different in terms of are you purchasing the machine? Are you renting the machine? Is there a contract? If so, how long does it go for? Will they allow you to suspend your service for several months with no fee? Or will they charge you for every single month or charge you some sort of deactivation and reactivation fee? So those are all, I mean, it's, it's the same conundrum that it is when you have to go and get a cell phone. Think through all of the same questions. Do they have technical support? Is it available on the weekends when you run your farmer's market? Or is it only available during work hours? Um, so those are all the same questions that you need to ask. You know, Sally, that's exactly right. Those are some of the questions that are included on our little sheet. The other thing I would say is Merchant Source, as near as I can tell, has been very interested in engaging the farmer's market community. And they post routinely on the farmer's market listserv. So it might help to generally pose a question about, has anyone had this trouble with Merchant Source and their fee structure and stuff like that, just to put a little bit of public pressure, because they do read the listserv and respond there. Well, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But also, as a suggestion, I know with Donna Hagemeyer, you had to get the, you have to register to apply for the machine, or apply for the FNS number, and then you have to get the machine. With Merchant Services, you have to pay for the machine before you can get the contract. And in order to get the grants, we had, I had never yeah, received And you them. don't have to purchase it. We just need an agreement or a contract. Okay. okay. So you can even have just an agreement okay. that this is what you're going to purchase. You don't have to have purchased it. Okay. But so that way. They wouldn't give us a contract without giving them the money to purchase it. Merchant <laughs> Services. So I had, I, I had to go, I'm sorry. Merchant yeah, In the past, the EBT and Market Fox Initiative um, has uh, supported um, the cost of staff at the market to run the machine and that sort of thing. We don't. Don't. Hopefully, very soon. Yeah, I, I think that our goal is to have all of the all of that budget stuff straight by mid-November at the latest for markets returning to the program. I think we're hoping to have applications out by the middle of December, so we really need to have that budget information by then. Kathy, I see you have a question. I think that we need to have a better plan, we need to have a plan uh, for the machines they crash. I mean, we got our machine about our five years ago with a crash. The minute that thing dies, then our market doesn't have money to buy it. So this program that is, you know, all subsidized with grant, crazy. So I think it takes it will take again our collective brain to say, well, how, what do we do with the next generation machine and the next one and the next one? crashing every two to three years. Yeah, so you Ours did, did crash, and he told us a month to fix it, and it was the first of August. We would have lost the whole month of August. Fortunately, Grand Rapids had one that they weren't using anymore, and we sent somebody out in the middle of the night to buy it from them. But I mean, it was uh, that that whole thing about a month's downtime to fix it. It's crazy, right? But the month of August, that's half your season. Right. 
So, Drew, well, that doesn't happen in regular retail. So, Drew, has it helped at all that you have a, that you have what sounds like more or less a master agreement with Xerox to? I mean, I'm sure there are these same problems faced by the markets in Michigan. But if you have at least, if you're only dealing with one company who has their one proprietary system and their their machines that go with it, that must make it easier. Well, we're still waiting to see that play out because that just happened last year. So before that, everyone had their own third-party processor, and now people are just starting to use the state contract because we're using iDevices in Michigan um, provided by the state. So I think that we haven't, we've only had a really a season under our belt. We haven't seen it. I haven't seen the benefits yet. Yeah. And Kathy, as far as the replacement machines go, um, with so certainly one of the goals of when we think about technology is to have is to have a more resilient uh, system, including being able to help markets back themselves up with those types of technology. But you know, before that, so before that happens, as long as everyone's dealing with their own provider, um, the technology is all different. So there's not a way to. to warehouse and a whole bunch of different machines to meet every market's needs. True. And just to add to that, we do train all of our markets on how to use manual vouchers when their machine goes down. So that has been an important part of our, as long as you have a cell phone, that it, when you need a backup, you use your manual vouchers. So I'd just like to throw out there from experience that I've had with feedback, how many uh, merchant service providers or banks or whatever have no idea what a manual voucher is and can't help. That markets figure those out or will not work with them. Okay. So yeah. it's a significant problem in the last year. Yeah. But you're right, the, the backup is the manual vouchers, which are available. Are there, I want to have a look over on this side of the room for a while. Are there questions on this side for the last minute? brought with me a stack of cards if you just want to grab one. Um, they're right up, right up here. Um, but, I, but I'm wearing orange and I'll just carry them around. Um, uh, but you're welcome to pick up a card and I'm happy to have an offline discussion if you remember about how people come into Did you have another? No. Oh, Donna has one more comment, it sounds like. Um, I know we talked about this earlier, uh, about trying to track down how many farmers markets accept um, SNAP. Um, the last count uh, that we went through, we were showing 65 farmers markets in Minnesota accepting SNAP. So congratulations to all of you. That includes the 15 from this year, so <laughs> we're going to catch you, Michigan. <laughs> Hey, I want to thank everybody who was up here uh, from DHS and uh, especially Brew Cross Brew Shield. Uh, it's 4.30. We're going to release you. <laughs> I want to thank you all for uh, attending today. I think it was been a, been a very good uh, conference. I hope you feel the same. Uh, we're going to do this again in the spring. We haven't set the date, but it'll be somewhere in the March uh, 20th area, somewhere like that. So we better find out if that's Easter or something. Um, but thank you again for coming and, uh, and uh, supporting the Minnesota Farmers Market Association. All right, uh, apparently someone left their earrings in the women's bathroom. Be right up here. Could be from the front bar. So how about you?